<laughs> okay, great. Thanks very much for everyone for coming out here and all the snow and everything. I know it's another lovely Toronto day. So today, as Wei said, I'm going to be telling you something about how uh, I've been working to try and say something about reionization uh, by trying to model quasar absorption lines and compare with real data. So here I'm just showing uh, in the colored light cone here an example from one of my simulations and on top an example of a real quasar spectrum that we're going to be trying to say something about. So the whole talk is going to be about reionization. So what is reionization? Well, basically, uh, after the Big Bang, the universe recombined and was like dense and cold and continued on like that until the first stars and galaxies started to form. And you know maybe this was kind of at redshift 15 to 30 or so, very uncertain. But as they started to form, they formed stars and black holes. And as these stars and black holes grew, they emitted ionizing photons. And so in this kind of schematic here, we just see an example of kind of the history of the universe. And the dark regions here are, is all this cold and neutral gas that we started off with. But as these stars and galaxies grow, we start to see these little bubbles of ionized gas forming. So as the ionized, uh, fo ionizing photons interact with the gas, they both ionize it and heat it up. So this is the universe kind of going through its last major phase transition, starting from being completely cold and neutral and ending up being hot and ionized. And so there's lots of open questions about reionization. I was at a conference a couple of months ago and someone said it's like a bad murder mystery novel where you want to work out the what, the who, and the how. So, well, the when is what, when did reionization start and when did it end? This is still, like, we have kind of rough numbers about it. We have a pretty good idea of kind of the midpoint of reionization, but we don't know the exact details. We also want to know the who, what were the sources that drove reionization. It's probably pretty certain that's driven by galaxies, but there could be some contribution from AGN. We know that there are AGN out there, so the kind of level of the balance between them is something we'd also want to work out. And finally, kind of the how, uh, like what were the shapes of the bubbles? Were they all very small or, uh, and eventually overlapped? Or if they were driven by AGN, maybe they were very big from the outset. And this is like something, again, that we can hope to dig out of uh, both yeah, existing and future observations. And so, OK, well, that is what reionization is. But like, why do we care? So I think kind of there's two main reasons, depending on where you're coming from. And the first is that by studying reionization, this is like an indirect way where we can learn about these sources. So this is just an example from a recent paper that came out this summer showing the evolution of the ionized fraction of the IGM as a function of redshift. So you start off with a very low ionized fraction because you're basically totally neutral. And as reionization progresses, you end up with something that's completely ionized at the end. And the green here is just a variety of different constraints that I'll talk some more detail about later. What I want to point out is these two different curves are both assuming a galaxy-driven reionization, but just making uh, different assumptions about the kind of galaxies that did it. In the case of the blue, it's assuming the kind of small galaxies were the ones that dominated, where in the case of the pink, it's the more massive ones. So by kind of learning about the timing of reionization, we could actually learn something about galaxies and maybe wh how likely is it that ionizing photons can escape from small or high mass galaxies, maybe learn something about their morphology or feedback effects. So studying reionization is kind of an interesting way to learn about these galaxies that it's kind of hard to disentangle this information otherwise. And the second reason you might be interested is maybe you don't care about galaxies at all, but you love cosmology. And one way you can do cosmology is with the Lyman Alpha Forest. But kind of a major degeneracy in any studies of the Lyman Alpha Forest is uh, that a lot of the effects that you might want to tease out, for example, if you want to constrain different models of dark matter, you care a lot about small scale structure. And this is very degenerate with how hot your intergalactic medium is, because these absorption lines can be broadened by thermal effects. So you might mistake uh, kind of the washing out of soap structure by warm dark matter for just your IGM being hotter. And this can have an effect on the flux power spectrum. This is just an example from another recent paper by uh, a group at uh, Harvard showing the effect of different reionization models on the shape of the flux power spectrum. So if you had a very detailed model of reionization that you believed, you could account for this in your models and further constrain dark matter. So how do we want to try and see any of these, this neutral gas? Well, kind of the best way, and probably how we'll all be doing it in like 20 years or something, is just to look at 21 centimeter in emission and absorption. There's lots of groups trying to do this already, and it's quite a simple idea. You just have your hydrogen atom there, 
and there's some probability that it will undergo a spin flip transition and emit a photon at a wavelength of 21 centimeters. And there's lots of groups that are going after this at the moment, mainly just through monopole experiments, but some are like LOFAR trying to do more detailed studies. Uh, but so far, there, most groups have only reported upper limits on this. There haven't really been any firm conclusive detections. Apart from this one by the EDGES group, which came out last year, which showed this really strong absorption signal at about redshift 17. And this is super exciting because no one expected it. But for that same reason, it's probably something that would want to be verified by other groups. Because both the shape and the position of this are not what you'd expect from normal models of reionization. And in fact, you might have to infer something about maybe a new model of dark matter to really try and make this work. But like, super exciting. And watch that space. But moving on to kind of the methods that we already know and love. One of the ways you can detect, well, ionized gas is by how it uh, interacts with photons from the CMB. So you have your CMB at redshift 1100, a photon comes out from it, and it will interact with free election just through electron just through Thomson scattering, which will uh, push it into a new line of sight. And this optical depth to Thomson scattering is something that's accounted for by Planck and other CMB experiments. And it's measured to like super high precision to this value of about 0 0.05 in the latest uh, Planck papers. And what the, this uh, optical depth to Thomson scattering constrains really well is the midpoint of reionization, when it was like about halfway ionized. And Planck, if you translate that number into a redshift, says that the universe was about half ionized at about redshift 7.5 or so, with kind of some largish error bars. If you want to translate that into a model of how reionization progressed, it becomes super complicated because basically, as I said, all you're really getting is this 50% ionized bit. So you can have some like wacky models that still fit the data pretty well. So this is very helpful, but it doesn't tell you the whole story. There, are, You can kind of split this up into different bins and try and say something about maybe excluding a lot of ionization at the high right shift end. And people do this and, you know, it, it's very hard for people really try. So another way that you can infer the presence of neutral gas is from look at how it interacts with Lyman alpha photons. So as a Lyman alpha photon passes towards some neutral gas, it has a potential to be scattered out of your line of sight. So you basically, from your point of view, it's just been absorbed, it's been lost. And so one way, one source of Lyman alpha photons is from galaxies. So you can kind of quantify this in a couple of different ways. You can say, well, I'm going to look at all my galaxies as a function of redshift, and I'm just going to count them all up. And I'm going to say, how many of them show Lyman alpha emission? What fraction? And so this is what is shown in this plot here. So as a function of redshift, you're just asking, what fraction of my galaxies show Lyman alpha emission? And the different colors are just two different magnitude cuts. And as you move from redshift 4 to 6, you can see that more and more of these galaxies are showing Lyman alpha emission. But once you get to redshift 6, it just drops like a stone. And it's kind of hard to understand what should be happening at the high redshift end, because the Lyman alpha emission is correlated with star formation. You kind of expect, uh, you don't expect that to drop off super suddenly at high redshift. And likewise, uh, you don't expect, one way you could get rid of the Lyman alpha emission, which is probably what's happening at the low redshift end, is for there just to be more dust. But you don't assume that high redshift galaxies will have more dust than low redshift galaxies. So this is probably not a property of the galaxies. It's probably a property of the intergalactic gas in between us and the galaxies. So it's not that this Lyman alpha emission isn't there. It's just that we don't see it. And so this is kind of a hint that something is happening once you get to redshift 6. And the other thing you can do is rather than just selecting galaxies by their continuum emission, you can select them by their Lyman alpha emission. And this is just showing examples of some Lyman alpha emitter luminosity functions here. And at the high redshift end, at different redshifts, there isn't much evolution, which is kind of what you'd expect. But as you move to higher redshift, you can see that the faint Lyman alpha emitters all seem to be going missing, from redshift 5 to 6, and then a bunch at 7. And so this is another sign that you don't expect there to be this drop off in the number of Lyman alpha emitters, but rather we just don't see them anymore because the Lyman alpha photons are all being scattered away. And again, this is kind of happening at the same redshift of about 6, which is a sign that something interesting is happening there. So the focus of this talk is also going to be about Lyman alpha absorption. But rather than looking at galaxies, it's going to be about quasar absorption lines. Uh, and in particular, the Lyman alpha forest. 
So the way this works is you have a quasar at some redshift, and the light from that quasar has to pass uh, to us where we observe it. But as that light travels to us, uh, it will redshift. And at, at each redshift where the Lyman alpha transition occurs, if there's neutral gas there, you will end up with an absorption line in the spectrum of that quasar. And so you can see here, this is the Lyman alpha emission peak. And as you move uh, blueward of Lyman alpha, you have this forest of lines, which is the Lyman alpha forest, which e with each of these lines corresponding to maybe like a filament of like gas that's slightly more neutral than the surrounding intergalactic medium. And at low redshift, I think this is around redshift two or three or so, you can just count up all these lines to do cosmology with. You can do like BAO, or you can fit the lines to say something about the temperature of the intergalactic medium. There's like tons of information there. But as you move to higher redshift, things start to become a bit more challenging. This is an example of a quasar spectrum at redshift six. And so again, this is our Lyman alpha peak, and this is our Lyman alpha forest. But rather now than having these individual lines that we can fit, we see there's just a lot of the light has just been completely absorbed. And so rather than kind of the lines being the norm, we now have little bits of transmitted flux being all that we see. And so you can imagine that it would be super hard, like basically impossible, to try and fit a pattern of individual absorbers to this because you basically have no information because you have these long regions where no flux is seen at all. So anything you tried to fit would be completely degenerate. Uh, so yeah, so what can we do? Is there anything interesting we can say about this? Well, one thing that we can say and that was noted with the discovery of the first redshift six quasars back in the early 2000s is that uh, like I said already, there's large regions of this Lyman alpha forest where no flux is seen at all. So these are all just a bunch of different quasar spectra at different sight lines. And uh, redshift six is about kind of here. And you can see there's just long, long regions where no, there's just no flux at all. And so this is a sign again, kind of occurring at this redshift of about six, where we could maybe infer that the intergalactic medium is becoming more neutral. So this ties together with what we saw from the galaxies. But the problem with trying to make this statement is it doesn't take a lot of neutral gas to completely absorb the Lyman alpha forest. If you have a neutral fraction of about 0.1% ionized or less, that would be enough to get this effect. So it's very difficult to say that you're seeing like large regions of completely neutral gas. You could just have something that's a little like weakly ionized. But I think what's more interesting than just saying we don't see anything at all and kind of what's going to form the basis of this talk is that if you take two quasars at exactly the same redshift, which is what I've done here, so the redshift uh, axis is on the top, so this is redshift 5.9. And if you line them up so they're along the same redshift axis, you can see that they look completely different. In this top one here, even though it's at around redshift 6 where we saw those regions of absorption before, you still have quite a lot of transmitted flux. Where in this other one, the red one, we have this incredibly long region where we just don't see any flux at all. And these are at comparative signal to noise, so it's not like an instrumental effect. It's a real thing that on this region we have something that's quite ionized, and on this region we have at least something which doesn't seem to be that ionized at all. So you could say, OK, is this just one long 160 megaparsec region of completely neutral gas? Are we seeing reionization happening? Well, it can't be completely neutral, because if you look at the Lyman beta absorption, which has a weaker oscillator strength than Lyman alpha, so you can see it out to uh, gas that's slightly more neutral, you can see in blue here, there's all these little regions of Lyman beta transmission, and the Lyman alpha is shown in black. So the gas can't be completely neutral. So it's not just that we're seeing one big long patch of neutral gas. So what's going on here? So you can take all these quasar spectra that we've observed, and you can try and you know, be more quantitative than just saying, oh, these look different. And you can, what you can do is, and what people tend to do, is to take each spectrum and divide it up into chunks of the same length, typically 50 megaparsecs, and then ask, OK, for that chunk, what is its mean flux? So if I went back here, you know, you just take one chunk, and this would basically have zero mean flux. And a chunk of the same size here would have, I don't know, maybe 10%. So you can do that for all the quasar spectra you have. And typically, for some reason, people tend not to want to talk about it in terms of mean flux, but rather in terms of an effect of optical depth, which is just related to the mean flux in this way. 
So the results of the redshift evolution for this quantity are shown here from redshift 4 uh, to redshift 6 and a half. And what you see is kind of from redshift 4 to 5, we do have this like smooth increase in the effect of optical depth, which is basically saying as you go from redshift 4 to redshift 5, you're seeing that the mean flux of the Lyman alpha forest is becoming lower and lower. And this trend increases as you get to redshift 6, and it starts to become more rapid. And by the time you hit redshift 6, you can see it's the mean flux of the forest is dropping very rapidly. And so you have a correspondingly higher effect of optical depth. But the other interesting thing that's happening is the scatter in this quantity is increasing. Here you can see that basically all the sight lines look the same. But once you get to high redshift, they all look very different. And again, you can kind of be more quantitative about this and take those points and divide them into different redshift bins. So this is just showing the cumulative distribution function in redshift bins of size uh, delta Z of 0.2, starting from redshift 4.7 and going down to redshift 5.9. And the colored lines are the observations. And the gray shaded region is what you'd expect from just evolution in the density field alone. So at redshift kind of 4.8 or so, you can see that the observations lie under this gray region. So that's saying that any scatter you see in the Lyman alpha forest at that redshift is just driven by, you know, sometimes you hit a void, sometimes you hit a dense region. That's fine. We get that. But what's interesting is as you move to higher and higher redshift, the distribution starts to kind of peel off from this region that can be explained by the density fluctuations, such that you have kind of the lower effect of optical depth end, which corresponds to the sight lines where we see a lot of transmitted flux. That's OK. That's explained by the density fluctuations. But as we move to the higher effect of optical depth, the ones that are basically totally absorbed, we see that you don't get that from uh, the density fluctuations alone. Something else has to be going on. And this problem becomes like increasingly drastic as you move to high redshift. Yeah. So when it's very heavily absorbed, how do you know what the continuum was before you absorbed it? So that's a good question. So people have like all sorts of methods for doing this. Sometimes uh, a kind of a popular one at the moment is to do machine learning. So you take your quasar spectrum and you have information on the red side of Lyman alpha. And so you can fit that side and train on lower redshift data to predict the blue side, and you can get your continuum that way. A kind of simpler method is just to fit a parallel, again, to the red side and extend that into the blue side. You can also just take templates from lower redshift and, again, fit them and assume they quit the shape of the quasar isn't evolving a lot. And so all of these do introduce some uncertainty, but kind of at like the 20% level, so not enough to explain this. But it is something, I guess, as you move to higher and higher data quality that you will want to worry about, but it's not the problem here. Okay, so yeah, the density field explains some things, but not everything. So what else, what other buttons can we turn? So if you just assume that the Lyman alpha forest is in photoionization equilibrium, which is at low redshift a very good approximation, you have that your neutral hydrogen fraction is a balance of recombinations, which are shown on the top half of this fraction, and photoionizations shown on the bottom half. And the recombination rate is just a function of temperature, so you can write that like that. Uh, these two terms, the electron density and H2 density, you can just say are a function of the gas overdensity. And the ionizing background is shown again on the denominator. So I've already said that the density field doesn't do anything for you, so let's forget about that. So the other two things we can change are the temperature of the gas and the ionizing background. And so we can see an example of how that works here. So I'm just going to show you an example for two spectra. On the top, I'm going to change the photoionization rate, and on the bottom, I'm going to change the temperature, keeping the other one fixed in both cases. And so you can see if I make the amplitude of the ionizing background lower, I get less flux. And likewise, if I make the gas colder, I get less flux. And if I make the amplitude of the UV background higher, more flux because the gas is now more ionized, and likewise for the temperature. So these produce basically the same effect. So, OK, so these are the two knobs that we can turn. But should we, do we have any reason to expect that this is what's going on in the intergalactic medium? Well, yeah, you can come up with arguments for both cases. So to get fluctuations in the UV background, you can basically say, well, 
maybe there's some fluctuations in the mean free path. So that I have regions near galaxies, uh, which are shown here, uh, where the gas is very ionized, so there's no absorbers, so the mean free path is longer. Whereas I move to voids, any photons that are coming from the galaxies are likely to have intersected with an absorber before they get there. So I have a very short mean free path in the voids. And this kind of uh, further exaggerates any effect that you get in the change of the UV background just from being close to a galaxy or not. So you can expect that maybe the mean free path would vary by a factor of five or so, just depending on what part of the density field that you're in, such that when you're near galaxies, you see way more flux, and when you're in a void, you see way less. So this is a very natural way to get these uh, changes in the UV background. Likewise, it's a very natural way to get fluctuations in the temperature field. And this just comes from the fact that reionization is expected to be a patchy process. So if I'm in a region that ionized early on, as I'm ionized, my gas will be heated. But once that's done, it's just going to start to cool down again. Whereas if I'm in a region of the universe that ionized late, so this is just showing the temperature as a function of the redshift, again, I'll heat up, but I'll cool down. But if I look at kind of the function of the temperature of my whole intergalactic medium, by the end of reionization, I'm going to have some scatter in temperature, just based on the fact that some bits of the IGM ionized early and some ionized late. And so this could give you fluctuations in the temperature field. So, is it right to say, just interpreting that plot, that there's a, there's a certain amount of heating that accompanies ionization, and once that's done, it's just anything that I from there? That yeah, so, uh, yeah. Cooling from Compton cooling and Hubble expansion are kind of the main two coolants. Yeah, and I guess like how hot you're heated here is going to uh, depend on the spectrum of the sources and how fast the ionizing front moved. So this is kind of a cartoon picture. Just wondering, so what's the, what's the recombination time in these regions? Uh, I think it's pretty long. I don't, I don't have an exact number, but yeah. I mean, like you, there's a, always going to be some kind of floor for the background, so eventually you're going to settle into this regime where your heating and your cooling are almost balancing. So you don't expect it to cool forever. Yeah, so these are kind of the two effects that people talked about, and they both kind of have their upsides and their downsides. Uh, in this case, it's not like super clear that you expect these fluctuations in the mean free path to actually happen. There's like an analytical, analytical model where you can put them in, but whether that's actually the case is another question. And also for this effect to actually match the data, you have to assume that kind of your mean, mean free path, I don't know how to say that, is very small and much about a factor three smaller than observed. Whereas in this case, the effect is going to be longer, uh, strongest for very extended reionization and where you have a lot of ionization early on. And so this is maybe disfavored from the CMB results that want you to be half ionized at around redshift seven. So if reionization is super fast, then everything's going to be close to being the same temperature at the end. So what we decided we'd do is to try and run some rate of transfer simulations that will contain both these effects. They'll have an inhomogeneous UV background just because we're actually following the photons, and they'll also take into account the temperature fluctuations. So the way we set this up is we have a GPU accelerated code, Aton, from Aubert Tessier. And it's super fast. Running a 2048 cube simulation on 64 GPUs only takes 12 hours. So the benefit of this is that uh, we can use the full speed of light, which a lot of radio transfer simulations don't do. And also, we can just run a bunch of them. So we can run a simulation, and we decide what we want to tune it to. We started off by tuning it to models of the photoionization rate. And we just have a model for our sources and we increase or decrease the ionizing emissivity of those sources as a function of redshift until we get the reionization history we want out at the end. So we basically just run, 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 and calibrate until we find a model that we like, and then we say, great. So yeah, as I said, first of all, we started by trying to match uh, the evolution of uh, observations of the ionizing background, and this is what we got out. So again, this is just showing the distribution of effective optical depths in different redshift bins. The blue is what's observed, and the orange is what we got out. So you can see it's like clearly not a good match. So we were confused about this because we thought, oh, well, our simulations have like all the relevant effects, and we've tuned our models to match some observed quantity. So what's going wrong? Well, although what we were tuning to was an observed quantity, which is the photoionization rate as a function of redshift, and there are observations of this all the way out to redshift six, 
it's not really a direct observation. People, you know, will observe some quasar and then they have a set of simulations and infer what the cyanizing background is based on their simulations. And in particular, it's pretty degenerate with the temperature of those simulations. So it's not exactly a, like a re true observable. It's kind of a derived quantity. So what you actually observe is just the mean flux of the quasars. And so in the simulation I showed before, this is how our mean flux changes as a function of redshift. And you can see that at all redshift bins, we're just overshooting it, even though we had this good photoionization rate, which is probably just saying the temperature in our simulations wasn't right. So we decided we run this again, and forgetting about this, and now just tuning exclusively to the evolution of the mean flux. Yep. So we don't do that. We just assume that the speed of light is the speed of light. And all that we change is, as a function of redshift, how many photons our galaxies are producing. I like your assumption better. OK. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I guess there's different ways of getting at this problem. And it probably depends on the kind of questions that you want to answer. Yeah, so we decided we'd run a new simulation. And this is uh, the re results of how it looked. So here I'm just showing some movies of the evolution of the ionized hydrogen fraction and also the temperature of the gas. Uh, the redshift's up in the top corner. Maybe it's too small to see. But uh, it's that kind of redshift 10 or so now. And you can see at high redshift, uh, there's not a lot of ionization happening. And I should also mention that at the low redshift end, we're tuning these to the mean flux. And at the high redshift end, we're tuning them to match the Planck optical depth, which kind of sets an upper limit on how much ionization there can be at high redshift. So as the ionization fronts move, you can see you get these very hot regions at the edge where the gas has just been heated up. But inside these ionized bubbles, uh, all the gas has cooled down. And you see that there's these tiny fluctuations just driven by the density structure. OK, so that's how the simulation looks. And maybe if you were looking very carefully at the redshift evolution, you noticed when it ended. So kind of conventional wisdom in all of these reionization studies is that the universe was ionized by redshift 6. You hear that like at all conferences and all the talks. What we found is when we took these simulations and we just changed to match the mean flux, which is like the real observable and the CMB optical depth, what we found is we got this is an evolution of our ionized fraction as a function of redshift. So we got something that's about 50% ionized at redshift 7, which is exactly what we wanted. But reionization didn't finish at redshift 6 in our models. It finished closer to like 5.3 or so. And so we've had these islands of neutral gas that are still persisting down below redshift 6. At redshift 6, we're about like 10% ionized or so. And so how does this fit in with our models of what we're trying to explain? Well, this is just showing a slice through the simulation, a light cone. So this is the redshift evolution on the x-axis, just spatial coordinates on the y-axis. And here's redshift 6, where everyone always said you have to be totally ionized by. And we still have these pockets of neutral gas, which are shown as the red regions here, down below redshift 6. And below that, yeah, they become rarer and rarer. And if we now look at the evolution of our effective optical depth, or our mean flux, as a function of redshift, we see that once we hit this region where we're starting to see these neutral islands, this is where the scatter really opens up in our simulations, which are shown in the blue shaded region here, compared to the observations, with, which are the orange and red points. And so really what it seems is what's driving these fluctuations in the effective optical depth is just whether you're hitting one of these neutral islands or not, which explains why at the uh, low effective optical depth end, you, were so, you could just be explained by the density field because you were just sitting in one of these ionized regions where kind of the missing ingredient seems to be that you need these neutral islands even below redshift 6 to explain the observations. And so you can again just now plot our new simulations as a function of these uh, observations. Again, the observations are in blue, our simulations are in orange, and now they line up super nicely. We get the mean right, because that's what we tuned the simulations to. But for free, we also just get the scatter. Uh, so it's great. It works. Super happy. But the, this is now looking at the Lyman Alpha Forest in these 50 megaparsec chunks. One of the things I showed at the beginning was this long trough that was 160 megaparsecs long. So what about that? So just to remind you, this is how it looked. Completely dark in Lyman Alpha 
but with these transmitted Lyme and beta regions. So this can't all be one neutral island. Something else must be going on. So we can look in our simulations to see do we have anything similar. So in Lyme and alpha, yeah, we get it fine. We have this really long dark region where you just don't see any Lyme and alpha at all. But what about the Lyme and beta? And we do get some Lyme and beta. It's great. So we do have maybe like it's not a one-for-one one comparison, but we do see these Lyme and beta transmission spikes even though we have this Lyme and alpha that's completely dark. So like quantitatively, it's a very good agreement. And because it's a simulation, you can just go into the simulation and see what's going on. So again, showing some light cones through the box. So the neutral hydrogen fraction, the photoionization rate, and the temperature. And the spectrum I showed before is this white dashed line. And you can see it basically does coincide with a region that's totally neutral, which are these red regions. But the ionization is very patchy. This isn't one completely neut neutral island. Instead, you have these little holes in it. And it's these holes that allow for the transmission of Lyme and beta. So it does seem that these long structures are probing ionized gas, which people have discounted almost immediately. It's just that it's not completely neutral along the whole thing. There's another interesting observation that you can go and test with these long troughs, which is, uh, so again, this is the same long trough that I've been talking about before, Lyman alpha, Lyman beta. And what people decided to do was to see how it was correlated with galaxies. So they went and they looked at Subaru with a narrowband imager. And this is the narrowband filter on Subaru. So you can see it lines up with one of these completely dark regions and also a region that doesn't show up too much Lyman beta transmission. And they just went to see count how many galaxies do I see in Lyman alpha emission around this very dark trough. And this was super interesting to do because the two models I discussed in the beginning, these UV fluctuations and these temperature fluctuations, made very different predictions for how many galaxies you should see. So this is just the mean density of Lyman alpha emitters as a function of radius along this very dark sight line. And in the case of the UVB fluctuations, you expect the darkest regions to be in the voids, so very far away from galaxies. So you expect the surface density of Lyman alpha emitters to decline as you get closer to this trough. Whereas for the temperature fluctuations, you expect the darkest regions to be the regions that ionized early on. And that's probably the regions that are closest to galaxies. So they ionized first, and they had time to cool. And at redshift 6, they looked dark. So you expect to see a lot of Lyman alpha emitters near the dark region. And the black points here are what the data prefer. So you can see the data prefer something that's declining at lower radii, some more in favor of the UV fluctuations. So we wanted to see how do our models compare to this. And they compare super well. So this is just a mock map of looking at Lyman alpha emitters as a function of their narrow band wavelength. This dark sight line would be at the center, and these uh, dashed rings are just moving out in radii of 10 megaparsecs around this dark trough. And you can see kind of far away from the trough, you just see Lyman alpha emitters everywhere. But in this innermost 10 megaparsecs, it's totally dark. You don't see anything. And you can just uh, compare directly between the simulations and the observations. So the black points here are the observations, and the blue is the sight line for the trough I showed before. And it's a super nice agreement. And I think this makes super sense, uh, super, yeah, because if you think about how reionization works, you have the regions near the galaxies ionizing first, and the voids are going to be last to ionize. So you expect that these dark regions are going to be voids, and so shouldn't show any galaxies. So I think this probably wasn't unexpected. But you could also say, well, you're talking about looking for Lyman alpha emitters in a region that's totally dark in the Lyman alpha forest. So are we just not seeing this Lyman alpha emission because the gas is neutral or because it actually is a void? So you can compare those. So this is, as a function of radius, just the average uh, decrement in the Lyman alpha transmission we see in these galaxies. And it's not super strong. Close to the trough, you do see like, slightly stronger absorption in Lyman alpha. This goes down a bit. But it's, you know, it's still 70%. You're still seeing a lot of the Lyman alpha emitters if they were there. But actually, what the strongest effect seems to be that you are just sitting in a void. So if you do the same thing, but now rather than looking for Lyman alpha emitters, you look for UV selected galaxies as a function of radius, just for different magnitude bins, you can see this also declines super strongly. So it just seems to be that there shouldn't be anything there. And this was actually confirmed in a recent paper from a group at Zurich. So I said that our model agrees super well with these models of the Lyman alpha emitters but so did that model with UV fluctuations. 
So is there any way that we can disentangle those? And yes, there is. So you can go and you can pick regions out of your simulation or from real life. Uh, you can look for quasars that have lots of absorption or no absorption. And you can go and count the Lyman alpha emitters around them. And in our model, uh, we, some, we would predict that uh, before the gas is ionized, the regions that are darkest are the voids because they're totally neutral. So you uh, don't expect to see any Lyman alpha emitters there. But once the voids are ionized, they should become very bright in Lyman alpha emission because they're hot and uh, low density. So if you also select regions that uh, do show a lot of Lyman alpha emission, sorry, yeah, if that do show a lot of Lyman alpha forest, they should also lie in voids. But the difference here is just before ionization and after ionization. Whereas in the model with UV fluctuations, you always expect that the voids should be dark, but the brightest regions should be over dense. So it's a kind of a way of disentangling this. Yeah. Uh, and in our, so just to say that more strongly, uh, in regions that show the most and the least Lyman alpha emission, if you just select two quasars, we would expect that they should both show no Lyman alpha emission as a function of radius because both the hottest and the darkest regions should both be lying in voids, where everything else should just kind of be in between. So, okay, that's the story with the troughs and the Lyman alpha emitters. So what else can we say about the high redshift intergalactic medium? So one interesting thing you can do is, so far I've only been talking about Lyman beta, or Lyman alpha, but you can also say something about the Lyman beta forest. So this is just uh, showing you as a function of like a, a probability distribution function for a bunch of different sight lines, how dark you expect these to be in Lyman alpha. Where if you look in Lyman beta, you can see due to its lower wavelength and its lower oscillator strength, you predict having a lot more sight lines that you should be able to have a lower effect of optical depth. Because the, effect, the optical depth of Lyman beta is only about 15% of the Lyman alpha optical depth. So this is great, you can probe the IgM when it's like at a slightly higher neutral fraction. But the problem with looking at Lyman beta is it's behind a foreground of Lyman alpha emission uh, at lower redshift. So you also have this additional contribution that you have to take into account. So the Lyman beta forest that you observe actually isn't so different to the Lyman alpha forest that you observe once you've taken all these observational considerations into account. Although you do predict there should be more sight lines that should have some more flux, so it's worth going after. So you can try and compare uh, our late reionization model to some observations of the Lyman alpha and Lyman beta forest. So this is just in three different redshift bins here, showing the evolution or co-spatial measurements of the effect of Lyman optical depth of Lyman alpha and Lyman beta. Uh, the black points are the measurements, and the blue are from our models, just for different confidence intervals. And you can see generally it's pretty good agreement, especially at low redshift. Once you move to higher redshift, you do see that some of the observations are lying in regions where we don't have a lot of sight lines. But I should point out that these measurements here are from these very long absorption troughs that I discussed already, so we probably don't expect them to be very common. So yeah, there's good agreement between the simulations and the models. All this is still just a super small sight uh, sample. For all three redshift bins, there's only 19 sight lines. So it would be great to make this bigger and kind of have more quantitative comparison between the observations and the simulations. So this is just for one ionization history. What if we moved on and we looked at like different ionization histories and different assumptions about the gas temperature to try and see can we disentangle any of these effects? So I've now run a bunch of different ionization histories, all of which are calibrated to match the mean flux of the Lyman alpha forest below redshift six, but making different assumptions uh, in the case of the yellow line here about how ionized the gas is at high redshift, or in case of the red line, how hot the gas is, and the blue line is the model I've been discussing before. So you can see this is just a function of the temperature as a function of its redshift. So again, the red and the blue have the same ionization history, but making different assumptions about the ionizing spectrum, whereas the orange line has this more extended ionization history. So you can uh, look and see how these models actually look in terms of the structure of the ionized bubbles. So again, this is kind of the fiducial model that I've been talking about throughout the talk. And uh, this is a model which has uh, more ionization at high redshift. It's about 50% ionized at redshift nine compared to redshift seven. And you can just see by eye, these look completely different. The structure of the bubbles is very different and you just have a lot more ionized gas at high redshift. Where in the case of a model 
with the same ionization history but just changing the gas temperature, it's not so different. And below redshift 6, everything looks very similar because that's where they tuned to match the observations of the lemon alpha forest. So you have done much freedom down there. So you can compare these different models to the data and you can ask how do they look in terms of their lemon alpha and their lemon beta forests. So the gray are the data and the colored lines are the different models I've been showing. And the blue shaded region is just to give you an idea of the cosmic variance in the models. And so for both the Lyman alpha and the Lyman beta, uh, all of these models agree pretty well. Maybe the model with a lot of ionization is almost starting to be in tension with the observations. When you take the cosmic variance into account, it's hard to say anything very strong. But the point that I want to make is these are the models that we have existing data for. But if you imagined what you could have in the future, pushing these out to higher redshift, again showing Lyman alpha and Lyman beta, but now showing three redshift bins above redshift six, where we know there are quasars out there, but we just need high quality spectra of them. Uh, you can say, well, can we tell the difference between those models as we push to higher redshift? And in fact, the differences between these models get increasingly larger as you push to higher redshift, because you no longer have the existing constraints that you've tuned your models to. In Lyman Alpha, it's quite hard because to reliably measure this effect of optical depth, you're probably gonna, not going to do very well out here. It's probably going to mostly be upper limits. So the real thing that it seems to be very powerful to go after is to get new measurements of the Lyman beta forest. Because here you can see there's quite a striking difference between the models in a regime where we think we can actually get a measurement rather than just an upper limit. So yeah, people should definitely go after this. It would be super cool and you could actually constrain the ionization history maybe out to like the whole second half just by getting measurements of the Lyman beta line. So that's super powerful. So that would be a great uh, improvement on the observation side. But what else can we do to improve things on the simulation side? So all the models I've shown so far have just been uh, modeling radiative transfer and post-processing, where we take density fields and we just compute the ionization step state as an afterthought. And that's great because it's so fast, but you are missing the back reaction of the density field from the photoheating, and this is something we want to take into account. So we're now working on that. Uh, so this is an example of just a simulation run with gadget, a normal hydro code, run with a uniform UVB, so everything seems, sees the same photo ionization and photo heating rates. And up here I'm showing the neutral hydrogen density and the temperature of the gas. And you can see that it just kind of looks very smooth. There's no, the only variations in it are from the density field. You don't see any of the structure from reionization. This is about redshift seven or so. If I compare this to one of the models that I've been talking about throughout the talk, where we do it in post-processing, uh, you can see that just by eye, the structure is completely different. We now have these neutral regions shown in orange and highly ionized regions shown in blue, where here you just kind of have an average of the both. And likewise for the temperature, we have these blue regions that are very cold, and we have all this complicated temperature structure which in, within the ionized bubbles. So we want to kind of get the best of both worlds and combine these, and we do so by feeding the photoionization rate maps that we take from this simulation into a gadget simulation. And this is what we get out, so it's kind of a patchy version of gadget, where we get all the structure of our ionization field but now we're also modeling how the density field evolves depending on whether it's in one of these hot ionized regions or these cold neutral regions. And you can see the effect this makes here. Uh, I've highlighted a couple of interesting regions. This is just zooming in on one of these maps of the neutral hydrogen density. And shown in the red circles, there's kind of some interesting features. So here is a region that ionized early on. So it's been heated for a long time and the gas has had time to kind of relax in this hot state and be gene smoothed compared to this region which is also ionized but was ionized later on and you can see this isn't, hasn't had as much time to adapt to now being hot so you can see a lot more structure in here compared to here and likewise the same effect here you can see like all these little lines here but in this circle it's a lot more smoothed so this is an interesting effect because again if you want to try and uh, say something about models of warm dark matter. This is an effect that so far hasn't really been taken into account in simulations because everything uses kind of the uniform UVB that I talked about beforehand. So you can go and you can say, well, okay, by eye there's some effect, but what effect does this have on the Lyman alpha forest flux power spectrum? And in fact, it kind of doesn't seem to have any uh, effect at all. So this is down the small scale region here where you'd expect to see this effect 
but it seems to be almost perfectly cancelled out by the fact that the regions that ionized early on are also cold. So you have this contribution between the pressure smoothing of the gas and the thermal broadening, and they basically seem to just uh, result in something that's completely similar to one of these uniform UVBs that was tuned to have the same uh, average ionization history. But you do see this interesting effect on large scales where you have this increased power just due to this patchy reionization process. So it would be interesting to kind of see can this actually be teased out of real data. So uh, for the last slide, I just want to say kind of what else can we expect on the way from the observation side. And I'm part of this large collaboration uh, which is part of a large program on the VLT and ESO. And we have 240 hours on x shooter where we're going after a bunch of these high redshift quasars to get really high quality signal to noise spectra. This is just showing a histogram of the redshifts of the quasars we're targeting. So we want to have spectra that have a signal to noise of 30, for which this red, uh, redshift regime is super good. So the red is showing the existing data, and the orange is data that's currently being taken that's going to extend the sample. And so you can see it's going to increase the sample by about a factor of four especially this kind of lower redshift end, but also with a bunch of sight lines extending to high redshift. So basically everything I've talked about today is you know, either going to be extended to high redshift very soon or done to increasingly high precision at the lower redshift end. So it's a very exciting time to be working in this area. So just to conclude, uh, when we run these simulations, if you want to actually match a real observed quantity of the Lyman alpha forest, which is the mean flux, you need to have an IGM that didn't reionize at redshift 6. It needs to reionize at more like redshift 5.2. And once you tune your model to match the mean flux, you completely solve this problem in the fact that different uh, lines of sight to the Lyman alpha forest look different. In this late reionization model, you can also explain the correlation between these Lyman alpha emitting galaxies and these Lyman alpha forest sight lines. And if you think about what you can do with the Lyman beta forest, it seems like this is a really promising direction to go after in future observations. And there's ongoing improvements happening on both the simulation side with these patchy gadget runs, and also with the observational side of these large samples that we're going after. So, you know, keep watching this. There's more data to come soon. Thanks. tuned to match the Planck value, so it's about 0 0.05, and high is more like 0 0.07, so it's like excluded by the Planck values. But it's still interesting to see what you can tell the difference just from looking at the Lyman Alpha Forest data. So you're model is based on some of the galaxies that are producing the ion Yeah, so we just assume a galaxy-driven ionization. So I think if you look at the temperature constraints from the Lyman Alpha Forest, you can kind of rule out that AGN are having a large contribution. But, but it, at the level of detail where you're comparing the cow dollars and so on, can you rule out AGN producing some additional biases in those? So what's interesting and what we find is when we look at this uh, evolution of the ionizing photons, which we only model as galaxies, but we do change the shape of it. If we look at the redshift evolution of that, at high redshift, you just can fit it by what you assume by a normal galaxy evolution. But at the lower redshift end, like below redshift 5, we find that we actually need the ionizing output to be increasing. And so we kind of say that's maybe a signature that the AGN are starting to take over, that you need these more ionizing photons, but we're not explicitly modeling it in the simulations. But that would be super interesting to start doing different source populations and see, can you tease that out? I mean, I haven't followed this field in detail some time, but since you are looking at a uh, laser to get the absorption lines, there's some additional information. You mean in terms of, I guess? Proximity, you know, in the region. Sure, so yeah, you can model what's going on. Uh, so when I take all these observations, you usually exclude that region, you exclude like 5,000 kilometers per second closest to the quasar to try and disentangle the kind of local effects. 
But I think if you want to say something about how AGN as a whole are contributing to the UV background, you're probably more worried about the AGN that you haven't detected, the faint ones. And I think it's, it's not clear exactly. It depends a lot where you put the knee of the luminosity function. Uh, that can change the answer you get. So I think that's a question that still needs to be resolved. Uh, since you said that sort of the optimal small volume simulations and that we ran into happens a lot patchier than at the previous ones. Is there any way of testing this looking at CMP measurements where you can better the patches than different optical depth depending on the yeah, so I know one of my collaborators was working on something to do with would it have an effect on observing beam modes, but I'm not super sure what their conclusions were. But I think, yeah, there's probably other things you could do with these simulations. It would be interesting to think about it. Can you say things about the H1 from the simulations? About the uh, 20 centimeters? So we don't model any x-rays here. So I think the temperature of our neutral gas is for modeling the Lyman alpha forest, that doesn't matter because the Lyman alpha forest doesn't care about the temperature of the neutral gas. But I think if you wanted to say something about 21 centimeter, you'd have to worry about that a lot. So at, at the moment, I don't think these are the right simulations to do that. I had a comment for the tell from CMB, you need really high resolution and the mode So is the assumption that um, the ionizing proton is to this gas before anything else does, so you can assume that the composition is primordial and that the heating and cooling is just set by the ionizing photon spectrum and then subsequent irradiation? I think that's probably fair, yeah. Is there like any chance of uh, metal enrichment playing any role in this evolution? I think if you look in simulations where the, so we don't include any metals in these simulations, but if you look in simulations where that is actually tracked, the region uh, that's actually like the, around the galaxy, the region that's covered with metals is very small compared to the size of these ionized bubbles. So uh, I think it's like the level of detail we're considering here, it wouldn't matter. Well, eventually there's this thing called JWST and that's when there's a high ratio of galaxies. Will that help your problem by actually knowing about what's there? So I think I'm, I'm not an expert in this, but as I understand, JWST will be amazing for like counting galaxies. So we'll see uh, just the no number wise how much you're out there. But what it won't do directly is say, where are the ionizing photons coming from? Because obviously that's something you just can't tell. So people are working a lot in trying to look at low redshift proxies for galaxies, that, like these Lyman limit leakers. I think like in terms of their emission lines and stuff, which is something JWST can go after. But I think it will definitely help, but I don't think it will completely solve the problem. All right, I'll ask you one. So you mentioned the uh, uh, high redshift H beta lab could be confused with the low redshift H uh, lambda R. And is there a way to remove this sort of large contamination by detailed modeling? So it's not really that they're being confused, it's that you see both of them at once. Right. Uh, so I guess the way we've been going after is just by forward modeling it, so taking both of them from the simulations and saying that you can't disentangle them. I think the uh, it will be hard to separate them just because the it depends on the density field, so you don't ex sure, you could just you have some additional information about the problem that's I think it's just hard because everything is so absorbed at these redshifts. If you could actually see specific uh, absorption lines, so at low redshift, that's a game you can play. But I think here it would just be very complicated. So I would say forward bottling is the way to go. Okay, another question? All right, let's uh, send Laura again.